Hi there, and welcome to the Love or Leave the Law podcast with your hosts, Adam Olette and Casey Berman. Hello, and welcome back. So happy to have you to the Love or Leave the Law podcast. Um, Adam and I today are going to dive into the beginning of what's going to be about a seven-step analysis um, of a lot of work that Adam has done around how to love the law again. Uh, you know, many of us are looking to leave the law, but there's so many of us in, the, in our community who don't want to leave the law, who shouldn't leave the law, who are looking for ways to refresh their, their love of the law, to look for ways to uh, uh, go back to why they uh, became a lawyer in the first place. And we're really going to dive into this. Adam has done a ton of work around this. Um, and I'm really excited to, uh, to kind of jump in. Um, and we're going to do so right now with, uh, with kind of this step number one. Um, Adam's written about this. Uh, it's in his books. It's in his work. It's in uh, a work he did recently on a, a webinar for the ABA. Um, and I've been honored to be part of it as, as he continues to, to formulate this structure. So Adam, the first thing I want to get into now that we're going to touch on today is, um, you know, what do people, and analyzing like what do our readers, our, our readers, our listeners, what do they really love about the law? And I think the question that really goes to this, that, that's really actionable is, why did they go to law school in the first mm -hmm. place? Yeah, and this was something that we, we did on this American Bar Association webinar, and one of the reasons why we're breaking this up into the seven keys is because people asked us to expand on it, and so why wouldn't we expand it on, on and on yeah. our podcast? And this, we started out with this question, why did we go to law school? And when we look back, and I look back on it, and I'd say, why did I go to law school? One, I wanted to make a good living. I thought that being a lawyer could help me to do well in the world, to make right. a good living. But more than that, I, I know I could make a good living doing anything because at the time, Casey, I was selling real estate with my mother who had been a broker at that point for 20 some years. And um, I was learning from the best and I was making a good living as a realtor after college for about a year. I spent a year selling real estate and um, I could have done that and I could have right probably done as well as I did as a lawyer, not going through all that stuff. But, but when I look back on why I chose to go to law school, one of the reasons was I really wanted to help people. Yeah. I knew I could speak well. I knew I could present myself well. Yes, I did hear from people, wow, you're good at arguing. Maybe you should go to law school. But that wasn't one of the reasons I went. But it was part of it like, well, maybe I'll find litigation to be something that yeah. I enjoy because I do like taking a position and arguing for it and stuff like that. But yeah. deeper than that, there was really a desire to help people out of their issues. Right. And after a while that became a liability for me. It really did. Why did that become a liability? Because all you're doing is listening to people's issues all day long, their problems, their challenges. Oh, this person uh, screwed me out of this. They, somebody breached a contract. Oh, I had a business partner and, or, well, God forbid, family law. I did some of that too. Um, and so it, it's difficult as you go as a lawyer to deal with people's problems. But in the end, we were uh, I was talking to a lawyer in San Francisco the other day that you and I are going to interview on the podcast. His name is Eric. And he says he just gets so much satisfaction at the end of the day when he settles a case for someone that had no money yeah. when they walked into his office and said, this landlord has screwed me for yeah. what, whatever reason. And he says, you know, the satisfaction that he gets at the end of the day because he's helped these people that really don't have the income to pay right. him by right. the hour. And that's really what helped me. It's like people walking through my door, uh, one of the things that I prided myself on was talking people out of litigating. Yeah. Yeah. Because as I did it for a while, it got to the point where it's like, this is not worth it. Yeah, this really is not worth it in the end because you spend a lot of money on time and aggravation. And most of the time, I write about this in the book, the judge splits the baby down the middle. Yeah, they do it because and you know what no clear I cut, you know, there's no clear cut winner or loser in most things. It's like, how do you how do you I, f I feel sorry for judges. Go ahead and jump in. I, what I would say is like I've there's like this delineation. It may be two, it may be three camps. But what people went to law school for was 
uh, to help people to really add value. I think you had then on the flip side, I know myself, you had people who didn't really it, not that they didn't want to help people, but they didn't really critically think about it. You yeah. know, like I joke, I'm, I was a Jewish kid who, who didn't like blood. So I didn't go to medical school. I went to law school. I just, right. I didn't even think about the job market. I was, whether it's lazy or just not critically thinking. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of people who, who didn't do that. They did it for family reasons just because, and then maybe in the middle there's, they did it for the money, the security, uh, the fame, the fortune or yeah. whatever the idea they had. The so status, like you the say, status. and I wrote about that and raising the bar is a status is a big thing. Yeah. I wrote about this a lot in the book for a reason, because when you put ESQ or attorney or lawyer at the end of your name, there is a sense of power that comes with that because you now, you know, attorneys that are prosecutors and stuff have power to put people in jail and police officers have power to arrest and that kind of thing. Right. But as a general note, as a lawyer, uh, we have power to take people to their knees economically with lawsuits. Yeah. And so for a lot of people, that power it, is something that uh, attracts them. And if if the idea of not critically thinking about it, it was a mistake to go to law school. We've talked about that. Those are people who might look to leave the law. Right. It wasn't a fit with them and so on. Right. The people, the power, we can talk about that today, but also what I want to focus on. And if you're, when the p- folks who are listening, who they really went to help, they really went because law was in alignment with them. Mm-hmm. Um, that is a group that I really want to focus on because they shouldn't leave the law. They are, th- they should be lawyers. And I guess it's that analysis of going back to why you went to law school, the, the authentic, sincere reasons of why you went to law school in the fir- first place that I know you talk a lot about uh, could really inform and help drive kind of a refresh and a relove of their current practice. One of the things that came to me after we did those episodes, Casey, on uh, why it's great to be a lawyer, one of the yeah. things that we didn't talk about, and we probably need to do a whole episode on this, and we already are lining up guests to come in to discuss this, but lawyers are change makers like few people on this planet can be. Why is that? Well, you look at what's happening in politics in the country right now with the ban on travel and, you know, I don't care what side you take on this. Lawyers are on both sides of this. And there's a lawyer that we've both reached out to, to talk with about being on the podcast. And we are going to chat with him uh, in, uh, in the next month um, just to see if, if he's a fit, but I know he will be because what he's doing is pretty cool. He created a website called airport lawyers. Yeah. And he's helping people that have every right legally to be in this country, uh, have a green card, have lived here. Like my father was Canadian. He never became a citizen because it was just easy to keep his green card. Yeah. Didn't really matter to him. But my own father was never a citizen of this country, yeah. and, and I could have had dual citizenship when I hit 18. And uh, if politics keeps going the way it is, maybe I will get dual citizenship. <laughs> Joking. But, you know, people say they're, they're going to renounce their yeah. citizenship. Yeah. I love this country, and there's a lot of things I think can change for the better, including our profession. But going back to the ability for lawyers to create massive change yeah. in society, in politics, in laws, all of it. We have that power and we should have talked about it, but it's something we're, we save for later, right? So there is the ability for lawyers to take on causes and help, help. And doesn't matter really why you went to law school. So if you didn't go to law school for a reason we've talked about and you just went because you needed to keep going to school because you couldn't find a job, whatever it is, the rest of what we're going to talk about is going to be perfect for you. So don't, yeah, don't lose us here just because we're talking about something that you may not align with right now. But a lot of us did go to help others. And regardless, um, you go so to what, help. let's go back to the question. Go ahead. Yeah. So I think like what you touched on it is uh, change is huge. I mean, when you think about if you're in your practice now, um, maybe you're doing other things and I know around the work, you're not feeling it. Should I leave the law? I run into, I, I talk with so many people who really shouldn't leave the law. And what it is that why they went to law school was to be that change, really to be that change. They went to really to help people. They went to make a good living. 
in providing value and, and helping yeah. folks. They met, they went because they've got the skills, the reading, the writing, the speaking skills that, that can help, you know, they went because they're, they're a peacemaker. They're, they're the adult in the room. They can, they can be in the middle of a, of a dispute. Maybe they went for some of the fame and the fortune. They went to get the paths. That's perfectly fine. That's great. Right. They, they went for this. So there's all these reasons that, um, you've talked about about why people go to the law, and I love this idea of don't don't get down on on your commute or that you got horrible clients or that you you just might not be doing the right thing day to day, and that's why you're unhappy as an attorney. But if you go back to why you did it in the first place, let's focus on, and I want you to expand on this. Let's focus on once you identify what it is you went to law school in the first place for, what it is you became a lawyer for in the first place, um, besides going up the partner track and besides making money and besides this and all that, what really, what it, what it is, how, once we're able to identify that, some of the things we just listed, how do attorneys really glom onto it, make it tangible so that they can, they can find that love for it again? Well, I think there's a disconnect for a lot of people when you think about making and creating change in society and people's lives and stuff like that. A lot of us think that we, we have to be stuck working for a non not for profit yeah. or uh, working for $30,000 a year where that's not going to pay your student loans for God's sakes. But we have to get past that idea that that's the only route as a lawyer to help create change. And it's a great when point. When you understand that, you can do so much as a lawyer in different niches. And I yeah. think that's where you're going with this question. Yeah. Go into something that you can really hang your hat on. And we've talked a little bit about this. We're going to expand upon it, upon it as we go here in the podcast. But where could you help and how could you be of service to other yeah. people like the guy that's doing airport law and like the people that are helping uh, indigence and in not working for not for profits, but maybe taking things on a contingency fee basis if that's a possibility for you yeah. in your state and depending on the laws. But there is a lot of ways that you can take what you know and help people, even if it's in the pro bono yeah. arena. I mean, I know for many years I was a guardian ad litem in Broward County in Fort Lauderdale and I was helping these indigent children and some of them are really needed help and there's not enough of those people to be guardians, to look yeah. out for kids. And, and so even if you're not doing something full-time, look at stepping into a role like a guardian ad litem or where could you be yeah. of service and help to others? Um, like the other thing that we were talking about as far as mentorship, Casey, is uh, the Florida Bar has a mentorship program that I got involved with and I'm helping some attorneys as we speak that are newer. This one yeah. uh, lady just reached out to me recently. She's five years in and She's got a, a family member that needs help on a real estate transaction and she has no idea what to do. And so yeah. I put my name on the list. People reach out to me. I talk to them. I walk them through the problems. And one of the things I have to say about that, and there's a caveat to young lawyers, is that don't get involved in something that you really have no idea about, even if you're getting help from a mentor, because there's a lot that you need to know. And so if there's yeah. things you need to know about it, you need to research it. You need to figure it out. Um, and a mentor can help. But And you know what I love about your point is like, you know, oh, I got to help. I got to go work for a nonprofit. I have to do something that won't me, make me that much money. So therefore, I, I want to make more money. I need to make more money. Therefore, I'm just going to stay in the job I'm in. And right. I think, you know, for leaving the law, I really work with people on what I call their unique genius, their purpose, and how they define that. But I think the same thing goes for staying in the law. I know I've worked with many attorneys in the past, many from in their 30s or 40s and the 50s. And uh, in, in other roles that, that I've done professionally. Um, I've seen transactional, I've seen litigation and so on. And when I think of those folks who enjoy their job, when I think of those who don't, you know, it's not necessarily that they're enjoying their job because they're helping someone at a nonprofit and, right. you know, they're not, they're making a pittance themselves. I think of them really doing what they are good at. There's one attorney who is, who is, is, 55 on been practicing for a long time loves privacy 
loves just focusing on the nuances around privacy as well as kind of disruptive technologies that are coming in, whether it's in legal and elsewhere that are pushing the limits, you know, a legal Zoom or, or other type of processes. And so he's kind of on the forefront of how, where does the law go with these new technologies, these new ideas? He's not a technologist. Right. He just loves digging into yeah. taking kind of old law and how does it apply to new technologies? There's another one who isn't really much of litigation. He doesn't like the litigation part. He's kind of the advisor, the consigliore. He's just got that, that personality of you're in the room. What's the deal? He's the adult in the room. Here's the issue. And you walk around going, right, that is the issue. And so these are being lawyers. These are being advisors. But what I really respect about these two is they have really found in business, helping corporations, they've really found what they're good at and then pursue that in kind of a very focused way. And they're very happy as attorneys. This perfect segue into what I want to talk about next, because there is opportunities for us as lawyers to start to look at what is it that we really enjoy yeah. about the practice do more of that. Delegate the stuff that we don't like and That's that we're the probably thing. not good at. So yeah. here's the key, because this is why I wanted to segue into it right now. Because when you start to do more of what you love, you're going to do less in general. Right. If you set your business up to run so that you're only doing high, high level stuff that you really enjoy, you're going to free up right. a ton of time for whatever it is you want whatever you want. And we're going to talk about this in one of the other keys. This is, you know, we're talking about the seven keys to, I love that you created this name, how to fall back in love or fall yeah. in love with the practice of law. We're going to talk more about life balance and, and stuff like that and what to do with that extra time if you really look at automating and delegating and all this kind of stuff. But if you really do want to make a change and you can't afford to work at a not-for-profit or you don't have any ideas to help people, aside from that, you can get ideas, right? Or if you, maybe you have ideas, what you do is you clear up some time that you would spend doing secretarial work, right? Or legal work. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that stuff. I've done all of it. I've done every single position job in my firm, no matter what thing, what we were practicing, what type of law we practiced, I did every single job. I wanted to know exactly what people did. I wanted to be able to train people coming in. There's loads of ideas that we're going to talk about on the, uh, just on that topic as we go. But stop doing that stuff if you can help well, it. <laughs> it, comes to the point of, it comes to the point of this. Why did you go to law school? Well, I went to law school because uh, I'm very good with administrative tasks. Uh, I'm not overwhelmed by paper. My mind really focuses on paper. I like to schedule. I like to, yeah. no, no, no. Many of us didn't yeah. go to law school to be no. a secretary, to be a legal secretary, to be a paralegal, to be an administrator. There's nothing wrong with it. It's and we just, need all those people. We and need there's it. people that do that stuff very well. That's how their mind That's works. Right. That's, That's right. not how my, our mind That's works. Right. And so when you focus on how our mind as attorneys work, the unfortunate thing is you get out in the business world and that's part of business is the paperwork, is the scheduling and so on. Yeah. Let's find others. Now people may say, well, I have a secretary. I've, I've got this. It's the marketing I don't want to do. It's the, okay, fine. So find other ways to market, which we're going to get into in the oh, other yeah. steps. But I think really to, to see, I'm getting all excited about this because I get so excited when, whether you're in the law or out, you are doing something in a job that aligns with what you want to do, that aligns with what your unique genius is. Right. And I think for the most part, many of us want to talk. We want to write. We want to, we want to advocate. That's what yeah. we want to do as attorneys. You got it. I mean, what I wanted to do as an attorney after I satiated doing that paralegal stuff, doing a lot of the secretarial stuff, because growing a firm, sometimes you don't have money to do that kind of stuff. But there are tools that you can use online that cost a lot less than secretaries at the beginning if you're hanging your own shingle yeah. or whatever, um, that you can use like a dragon naturally speaking that I use yeah. a lot that dictates what you say. And all you yeah. got to do is just talk and it goes along in a Word document. I mean, yeah. I used that years ago when I was drafting um, pleadings and, and answers and all that kind of stuff. And it saved me so much time. But when I first started practicing law, I was using a dictating machine. And when I went to work for this guy who was my partner for 10 years, he had a machine that recorded on tape and he had a little microphone. Yeah. <laughs> and that shit was old. I mean, that was Adam, say the old. name. We're going to have it in the show notes. But the name of that Dragon Naturally is Speaking. And they yeah. have a lawyer 
one that has a lot of legal words in it. It's, it's, it's a little more expensive than the general one, but um, you can get yourself a wireless headset, which I have. I pop that headset on. I click the button. It comes on. I can tell it go to sleep. It just dictates everything you say. It, That's right. It's good about 98% of the words that you're going to say. It will recognize and have them That's there. Right. Um, you can even open programs with it. It does so much, but just that one program can save you a tremendous amount of time where you don't need a, a secretary to do that kind of stuff. You can have them clean it up and, and put headings and we're gonna and get, stuff. We're going to get into the – I know you got a lot of these for the, the next episodes where we get into that. But I right. think what is huge and what, what, I, what really resonated with me by your work here was – when we start to believe that a lot of the things, marketing, administrative, um, a lot of this business building is what you need to do as a lawyer, that's what you need to do to build your business right. as a law firm, right. as, as a practitioner, um, as someone within, within a firm, as an associate or a partner. But really to do the work you went to law school for that's not it. I, I, I love how you encourage people to just really get laser focused on what it is they enjoy. And that's really what it came down to for me because I was doing so much of what I didn't like and it right. got to the point where I was just bogged down with all this stuff and I was stressing myself out yeah. over it. And it's part of the problem I had, and I'll be brutally honest, which most of the time, well, I'm all the time, unfortunately, all the time. sometimes a little more than I need to be. But one of the things I, I started looking at was why do I believe that I can do this better than someone else? Yeah. Why do I believe that I can do the bookkeeping better than someone else? I don't like it. I don't, it's minutia. I hated it, yeah. but I didn't want to, it's like, it's a, a battle that we have inside ourselves of giving over control yeah. of something that we deem very important. But if you take the time and you, and you train someone on how it needs to be done, there's somebody yeah. else that could do it better than you. I guarantee it. Right. If you don't like it, what I'm saying now, right? Uh, and it's all just a belief system that we have in our minds of, I need to do all this because it's all important and, and it's all crap. As far as I'm concerned, yeah. you don't need to do everything. And what, where the satisfaction in life comes, the real joy for me as a lawyer was letting all that go and saying, I don't need to do all of it. I don't yeah. want to do all of it. That's right. And, st and I, so I sat down with a list and said, what is all the stuff I do during a given day and week? And I started looking at all these things. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to do this. There was That's some right. stuff in the middle, right? I didn't hate. I didn't love. But yeah. I would do it until I taught somebody how to do it or found somebody that was very good at it. Yeah. And, and as we get going here, we're going to talk about how to create ideal teams of people and, and how to attract those people or how to take who you have and move them into being more ideal. I did That's it. Right. I had people that I thought I was going to have to fire. And I started reading some of these books. And I started to... It, Adam, when you did that exercise and saw everything that you didn't like within a law firm, within right. a business, you've talked about this, but what was it that you enjoy doing as a lawyer? Just as an example for people as, they, as they're looking to do this exercise. I loved the marketing. I loved the networking. I loved getting yeah. out and meeting people. I love building a sphere of influence, which I talk a lot about in all the stuff I'm doing. It's, it's that important. And I really love that because... The more I was out meeting people, the more I had my information in front of somebody and the, the better off I would have an opportunity to get referrals from people. Yeah. And without that connection, without that sphere of influence and building that and creating meaningful relationships with people yeah. in business, uh, I would have never been as successful as I was. And yeah. um, I had a... a I had a private club I still belong to, and they put me on the board of governors there. I think I've talked about this before, but they put me on the, the board of governors because I lived in this place. I was there three days a week. We even had an office that we uh, leased in that building just yeah. for our law firm. And why did I do that? Because there was so many good people there that yeah. I connected with that were sending me business. And I was meeting people for lunch and getting people to join too and bringing guests and all this stuff. And just that one place helped me build this network really yeah. rapidly. I've joined, I think, a year out of law school. Someone told me about it. I had never heard about it because I was a new lawyer, and, and it was um, in downtown Fort Lauderdale, and, and I hadn't done a lot in downtown Fort Lauderdale because I lived out west in um, the subdivisions out there. But I can tell you that as I started doing more of that, and then the other aspect of what I really liked as I'm doing more of the networking and, and then going into um, – training. I was teaching people. 
I was taking yeah. what I learned as a lawyer and as a litigator on real estate contracts and representing buyers and sellers and representing realtors right. against, you know, somebody had a, a problem with the state of Florida where someone uh, did uh, a complaint about them. I knew so much about right. all of that. And I was like, I need to start getting out and teaching people. And that I truly love. This is why I'm here on this podcast I with you it. because I love to teach and share pe with people what I know, what I've learned, what has made me successful, what's helped me in my life in general, and what's helped me to grow a law firm and do exactly what we're talking about. What? And that is love what I did. I love how what, after you did this assessment, you shed everything and you're like, I like to talk and schmooze and network to yep. bring in leads, but also to, to help others. And then I like to help. And I know a lot of attorneys can go, wait a minute, hold on. That wasn't in the job description. That's not an attorney job description. And what I think we're really challenging people to do is to kind of rewrite their job description, yep. to pare it back, to whittle out the other stuff. So we're going to get into um, details in a sec, and I know we're, we're, we're almost done with this, this episode. Everybody, yes. we're, the next episode coming up, Adam's going to jump into a lot of real actionable details about how to, how to do all this. But Adam, I want to end with this. For the person who's nodding their head but going, Adam, I hear you, but I'm not a schmoozer. I'm an introvert. I'm not a networker. I don't like marketing. I like the, I like the actual uh, getting in the details of the law. I like legal writing and research. I believe it or not, I like to geek out on brief writing. Um, sure. Or I'm a bulldog. I actually like fighting or whatever it is. What what are these steps for those people who who want to find what they they love in the law? But it's not the marketing, it's not the mentoring, it's it's some other aspect of it. It's it's maybe a substantive aspect of it. Sit down and do exactly what I did. Mm. Figure out what is it you do in a in a day, in a week, in a month, and look. Take what I did was hate. I didn't know like it's okay. I'm okay with it, right? I, I can continue to do it, but it's not something I really want to do um, or I really enjoy it. I love it. And yeah, start to take all of those things that you really don't want to do and find people to do them. How does someone in a firm, if, if, Bill, if, if you know, bringing in new clients is the way to get up, uh, move up in the firm, um, how do they, if they can't market, if they can't schmooze, if they're an introvert, how do they progress? How do they do that? Or how do they build their own solo practice? Is it just, is there another way to, to do that? All is not lost if you're an introvert. Yeah. When I started out as a lawyer, I was a bit of an introvert, even though you bring me somewhere, I'm the life of the party. You know, I stand out, I'm this massive guy and I stand out in front of people, but. Adam but says nine, everybody. Yeah, Adam's tall. And, and, and as a lawyer, I was somewhat reserved at first because I didn't know really what I was doing. Um, we don't get taught how to do the law. We get taught right. some ba basics in the background and, you know, we get taught some stuff and, but it took me a good year to come out of my shell and realize, you know what, you really do understand what you're doing and you've learned a lot. And now I was doing a lots of closings. I was already going into court. And so one of the things that is a possibility for people now, which has never been and was not a possibility for me in 1998 when I started practicing and I started in 97 working for uh, the guy that became my partner quickly or shortly after that. But um, one of the things you can do is you can literally network with people online. That's what LinkedIn is. Yeah. And one of the things I want to share with people in, a, in some of the later episodes is how to really utilize LinkedIn to grow yeah. a sphere of influence. Because what I ended up doing was using video to train people online, doing live webinars, which I now call live training because that's what it is. A webinar has got this cliche to it, but a live training for people that are your uh, referral partner candidates or people that could send you a lot of business, you can do that kind of stuff where you can record it and play it later, put yeah. it on YouTube, but also to create relationships with people on LinkedIn um, that could be a good referral partner where you could send business back and forth. And it's really not about you. It's about what you could help them with too realize that yeah. we're going to talk about this many, many times over and over, but when you're creating a, a, a business relationship with someone else, it isn't about you. They don't really care about you. They don't want to be bugged by you unless yeah. you can help them. So what can you do to help them? And what I started doing was yeah. recording videos 
for realtors and using software to, to edit it and uploading it to YouTube and then s building a list of people that I was already doing business with that I knew. Asking yeah. them, you know what, would it be okay if I added you to this list because I want to send out trainings. I want to do a couple things a month. I want to train you. And then I would go out and meet people or I would connect with realtors on LinkedIn or mortgage people on LinkedIn. And I would send them an email saying, oh, hey, here's who I am. And here's a, nor well, here's a normal email. I get them all the time when, I, when people try to connect with me on LinkedIn. Hey, here's who I am. I'm so great. I'm amazing. You should work with me. You should refer me. I delete them. Don't yeah. ask me what I, I can do for you. Ask me how we can work together. Ask work me together. how we can create a partnership doing something. Ask me what, tell me what you can help me with. And so That's what right. my help for people was is training them on how yeah. to be a better realtor, how to make yeah. more money, how to put a contract together that was as airtight as you can get it. So if a t some attorney came in because their buyer or seller was saying, get me out of this thing, even though they yeah. were probably legally bound to it. Yeah. Get me out of this thing. They're going to take a nitpick something that you didn't do correctly. You didn't fill in a blank. You didn't do, you know, I call it the red flags of contracts. Right. And to me, for me and my businesses, that put me over the top. Yeah. And after a while of doing live workshops at people's offices for 15 years, I started doing it all online. I didn't yeah. go into offices. I wasn't even networking because I had built a sphere of influence that was so big uh, referral partners and yeah. then kept on getting new ones where people were sending us closings from Facebook ads that I was doing, driving them into a recording of a, a web sh webinar that I did on contracts and people were emailing and they still do these. There's yeah. 70,000 views of my YouTube videos that my wall partner, Candace and she's my partner as well in life. We did. Um, people still email me. Oh yeah. my God, thank you so much for doing this. Nobody even does this kind of training because it's real world training. Well, I think so what's, you can do that. Ahead. What's huge, I think, and, and love, and the two takeaways I had was, one, whether you're an introvert or someone, there's other ways to network beyond shaking hands and getting yeah. a drink yeah. and going to those. Those are good. In-person's great. It's still something extremely valuable, but there's other ways to do it via LinkedIn and elsewhere. And I think this, the second part, which is huge, is the first one is about another channel. There's other channels to, to meet people beyond just in person at That's a right. schmooze because that can make people feel uncomfortable. I think the other point that you mentioned was as you get better at this or once you are feeling really good as a substantive uh, uh, expert or someone who just understands the law very well, that speaks for itself. That's right. And so when you, people will feel and understand how good you are. And even if you're not the most charismatic person in the room, that's okay. That's great yeah. because you can connect with people around the substantive learning of the law um, and they will see it. And then that can lead to, to more business, to more opportunities, to that networking. So I, 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 to go back to the original point, focus exactly, it doesn't change for depending on the personality you are, focus exactly on what you enjoy, what you're good at, and then based on that, that can inform what you do next to either drive business or to delegate or to really where you should double down on what, on what you like to do. Last thing on delegation, and we're going to end this episode, we'll get to point number two, key number two, but um, really delegation is an art and it's, yeah. there's a way to master it and I did. One of the things about giving up control, and we can do a whole episode on delegating. We need to. We will. Um, but one of the things about delegation that you have to understand is when you're having a problem giving up control of something because you think you do it better than anybody else, yeah. train them on how to do it. And we're, you and I are working with this on our virtu with our virtual yeah. assistants. Like, they need to know what you expect from them. And yeah. so if you think you're very good at it, even though you don't like it, train them on how you yeah. want it done. Create a checklist. Create a, a detailed checklist. Yeah. And, and this is something that uh, I did with all my companies in terms of create a detailed checklist on everything that gets done for a client in any aspect of real estate transaction, a probate, a will, um, business transaction, or even we did loads of uh, loan closing documents and represented banks. We created checklists for all this stuff. And so yeah. you need to train your people that you're going to delegate to on how to do it the way you want it done. That's you can't right. think that they're going to have ESP and figure it out on their own. So 
one of the things that I advocate and I we're doing now for the people that were on our on our team is recording videos for the position yes, on right. how to do something because it doesn't matter if if it's Susie or Bill or Liz, it doesn't matter who's in that seat. If you record a video for them, when someone new comes in, they can get trained. That's right. And you have to do it only one time. But you know, the, the issue with delegation, it's, it's, you're absolutely right. I, I just was thinking of like the, the four or five steps of delegation. The first step is you get so excited. Great. I can delegate it. I don't right. have to do this. The second step is you get a little overwhelmed. Like, Oh God, I got to do all this upfront work. I got to make a checklist. Like, uh, the third step is you get a little mad. You're like, don't you get it person? I'm delegate. Like you got to train them. Yes. The fourth step is, wow, they're actually doing it. I'm not that important. They're like, Hmm, wait a minute. Like what is my role in life now that I don't <laughs> have to do this anymore? And then the fifth step is total and utter satisfaction of, I didn't like that doing that anyway. Yes. This person's a lot better at it. And now I've got time to do more work or to see my kids. Like it's really this up and down, ironic set of feelings. Um, and if you can get through the initial overwhelmingness and frustration, it opens up so much for you. You can't imagine what it does for your life. If you do spend the time yeah. and go through this process we just talked a little bit about, um, it, it just opens up so many doors. And if you're doing yeah. it where, okay, I, and I've had it happen where there's been iterations of different videos where, okay, I did the first video and I trained somebody how to do that. Then some new questions came up and, oh, you know what? I need to, I need to sh do this a little bit differently and do it again. And then it doesn't take that many times until you've mastered or you add another little blurb at the right. end. And if you don't know how to do video, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah. Um, I, I have a free live training I did that will uh, offer to you if you're on the podcast um, group, if you're part of the community, loveorleavepodcast.com. We'll be sending that out to you so you can check that out on how to get yeah. started using video to do anything. This is one aspect of it, but you can do stuff like I talked about in terms of video marketing. That's right. I'm creating a whole class around this idea because there is enough to it that I can teach people from A to Z what I did as a lawyer and how I was able to generate leads and, and referral partners from, and, and never meet them. And never, right. I still to this day have not met some of them because I don't need to because I've generated right. so much trust in me based on the teaching. Uh, so there is a, a lot of things that th are, there are to learn <laughs> as yeah. a lawyer. And I think that's the biggest problem we have is our, in our profession is once we get into a niche and we learn it and, and we get comfortable with it, <clears throat> we think we're done, but it's just right. the beginning. It is. Because there's so much other thing, so many other things to learn in life. So let's wrap this episode up. And um, in the next episode, we're going to talk about really getting organized. I think this yeah. is one of the <clears throat> main keys. The last key I think is the most important and it's all about beliefs. I think that is the most important one. Uh, and if you learn anything from this podcast, it's going to be beliefs will, that will change your life. But the next one for me, and we've talked a little bit about it, and I talked about it in one of the Insight episodes, but we're going to deep dive into this a little bit more. Why you need to get super organized. Yes. It will, it will change your life as well because it did for me. I went from working 12 hours a day to working four or five hours a day and making more Sounds money. obvious, which it is, but you we're going to dive into detail in the next episode. Adam, thank you. Thanks, uh, everybody, you know, this first step was around really going back to the source. Uh, I think a lot of us are muddled and, and when it comes to trying to love your practice again, refresh it. Uh, let's keep it simple. Go back to why you went to law school for the first place, in the first place. And don't be afraid to jot down ideas that may not seem that applicable. If it comes down to, I just love reading the law. I just love diving into it. I just love marketing. I just love shaking hands. I just, then that's what it is. But go with how you feel. Um, and then once you really feel sincere about what those reasons are that you went to law school in the first place for, that you became a lawyer for the first place, that then really drives uh, tangibly and, and tactically what you do moving forward to, to actually love your practice. Again, That's right. we're going to dive into details uh, in the next episode. Please come back and join us. Adam, any, any closing comments or anything I missed? No, I think we've covered all of this as far as key one, probably a lot more depth than we had planned on, which is perfectly uh, great. I mean, this is what we want to do is we want to yeah. give people as much information as we can. But one of the things I want to offer to you is to, is to get into our community, loveorleavepodcast.com. 
uh, get in there and because there's going to be some free trainings that we do that no one else will have access to. And you'll right. have access to the transcripts of these episodes, uh, iTunes links, the video links, um, a load of different stuff that is only going to be available to people that are part of the community as well as a uh, closed private Facebook group where you can say anything you want and only yeah. the members of our group are there listening and, and helping and sharing. And so right. uh, I, I will have a link to do that when you join up to the, with the community. If you're interested, we want to have you there if you want to be, but we right. are appreciative of you being here and we're going to jump into uh, key number two in the next episode. So thank you. And we will talk to you all soon. Thanks everyone. 